Hey, what's up, YouTube? How's it going? Lil Birdie told me you might want to learn how to design a tiny house floor plan. I might be able to help with that. I hope I can help with that. My name's Angora Bills. I'm an architectural technologist based out of Western Canada, and I model buildings in 3D for a living. I also live stream home design on Twitch. So starting back in May, my community and I have been working through the design of a fictional tiny house from start to finish, kind of following the design process that I'm familiar with in my line of work. It's almost February 2024. Uh, we are not done the design of this house, but the one thing we have finished was the floor plan, and so I thought it would be hopefully helpful to share that process with all of you guys and see how we got there. So this story starts back in late April when we launched the series on our tiny house design. Today is kind of an exciting day because it's it's a clean slate today. We're starting a brand new design series for this tiny house. I'm so excited about it, but we're not actually going to build it. Maybe I'll build it one day. So we decided right from the get-go that we wanted to design this tiny house on a trailer. And this decision was for a multitude of reasons, but I summarize it pretty good here. Generally, from what I've seen, local municipalities don't allow building dwellings that small. There's a lot of code issues with tiny houses and things like exiting and fire safety and stuff like that. So where a lot of tiny house builders get around that is by putting it on a trailer because then it doesn't really classify as a permanent dwelling anymore. I think it categorizes it more as like an RV or like a, like a trailer <laughs> or, or a mobile home. So before we could get too into this, we had to spend some time researching tiny house trailers. I guess trying to decide what makes a good one. Like, I didn't know anything about tiny house trailers. I kind of was flying in the dark here, but I, I didn't know if you had to find a trailer that is specific to tiny home construction or if you could just use any flatbed trailer. We did a bit of traversing and primarily I thought I wanted to select the trailer first before we got into our house design and select the size of the trailer first before we got too far into it. Spoiler alert, we actually opted to design the house first. Stay tuned to see why. Tiny house trailers. I feel like we're getting, oh, this is a specific manufacturer for them. Okay, we'll pick a size. Let's pick a size today. To choose the size of your trailer, it's important to know what you want from your tiny home. Some things to consider is how many people will be living in it, how much weight your vehicle can pull, how many separate rooms you would like, how much storage you need, and what style and design you prefer. Now I'm wondering, well, like we can keep some of these nominal sizes in mind, but like here, this Tiny House Trailers Canada does have a whole list of different lengths. They're all 96 wide. This is Tiny House Trailers Canada, so that tells me that they are aware of the bylaws. Oh, interesting. There is a 100 foot wide, or sorry, 100 foot, 100 inch wide model, and there's a 120 inch wide model, which is 10 feet wide, which tells me that you are able to go wider than this conventional 96. Okay, for the sake of simplicity, maybe we'll just design to the 96 inch wide standard, but I think maybe keeping in mind these nominal lengths between 20 to 36 feet, Maybe we select which trailer size we use after we do more of the programming in the schematic design phase. So I can do a full video discussing tiny house trailers and what goes into those if you're interested in that, but just know that this footage is from my April 28th VOD if you want to actually take a gander at the research and how we looked into this. What we did decide to establish early on though was the envelope and the wall thicknesses that we wanted to use on our tiny house. This is something I really wanted to figure out early on just because given you only have a certain range of widths that you can use for a trailer that is road legal, every inch matters. We did opt to go with a six inch stud envelope uh, just because I'm a architectural technologist and a huge nerd about thermal retention and building envelope efficiencies. That is one thing I wanted to make sure we factored in when we were doing our floor plans. Disclaimer, this was my best crack at tiny house trailer research. I am not a tiny house builder myself, so if you are or you are familiar with this process and you can correct me in the comments, I would love that because I love learning. So we have our constraints. We know the dimensions that we're kind of trying to operate within. The next step from here is moving into programming. Programming is essentially determining your needs and values that you want from a space, using that 
to generate components or elements that you want incorporated in the space. And those elements I view kind of like Tetris pieces that you then configure together to create a floor plan. When you're when you're thinking about what goes in a space, and there, there's obvious things like we know we're going to want a kitchen, we know we're going to want a bathroom, but what programming really gets into too is like how you are using your space, who is using your space, and what are their values and priorities. If the person that we were designing the tiny house for had mobility challenges, for example, well, that needs to be taken into account in this phase because that means we can't utilize any lofts as an example. Now, I'll spare you the details of programming because it's sort of long, kind of tedious, and it's also very specific to what design you're working on. What we do with this tiny house series is probably vastly different from what you would do with your own tiny house design. Generally speaking, I split the programming process down into two parts. The first part is breaking down the needs and values that I have from a space. And I do this kind of using a who, what, when, where, why sort of list. We leave the what's for last. And when we get to the what's, those are what elements we want based off of the answers of the first four questions. Does that make sense? Initially, I was like, maybe we'll do this tiny house just kind of arbitrarily and we'll create like a fictitious climate client. But I'm going to be honest with you guys, I kind of want to do it for me. <laughs> I guess using myself and my partner as the context for this is a little bit easier in terms of speed, maybe. Like I can answer these questions really quickly because they're coming from a place of like my own understanding. I guess the what is when we'll talk about what we need. And we can kind of use the context of these three things that we've answered to really get into what we want. And this can even be on its own separate page. I like to tier it, where tier one is absolutely mandatory. Tier two is would like it a lot. <laughs> and tier three is could take it or leave it, but it would be kind of cool. Tedious elements aside, programming is one of the most important phases of the design process. Like, I'm not kidding. I did this for our Chevy camper van that we are renovating, and we're in the process of building it out right now, and I refer back to our programming all the time because there's so many things that are interrelated that I want to make sure I actually remember to incorporate. I literally have forgotten things that I wanted to include just because, and, and this is the same with a tiny house. A tiny house space is so interrelated. There's so many overlapping components and there's so many components that might serve multiple purposes. Uh, so I really encourage you to spend a lot of time thinking about this before you just start diving into floor plan design. Once we have the programming sorted, well, now you can get to sketching. Okay, so before actually getting into sketching, I used my iPad with an app called GoodNotes uh, with a grid paper overlay, and I structured the grid for one square to be a one foot by one foot measurement. This is something that you can do on your iPad or you can do it uh, by hand on paper. I do wholeheartedly, like grid paper is a godsend or the like gridded dot paper, I'd advise that because it just makes it so much easier, <laughs> I swear. Just for this early sketching, this was kind of the logic that we used. We'll do the tiny house design based off of kind of the nominal sizing of trailer options. The average trailer length that I'm seeing seems to be 28 feet long. I think I think I'll draw a rectangle just so we get an idea of what the, the 28 foot extents are, but if we need to bump out or bump down two feet at a time, we'll do that. At this point with sketching, we did work through a lot of logic on stream, and I do have a Twitch VOD playlist on my YouTube channel if you wanted to re review those again yourself. But we did kick things off using a strategy called bubble sketching or bubble diagramming. I'm gonna segue into a compilation of highlights about that, but just note that at this point, we are throwing a bunch of shit at the wall to see what sticks. How I've done this, especially more in this schematic phase, is kind of utilizing bubbles or like delegating spaces first and then distilling them down from there. For example, I really like that U shape 
kitchen design that we've seen. And in order to do a kitchen on three walls, we'll need it on one end or on the other end, right? So that means, we'll talk about doing a kitchen here. The nice thing I like about this too, is I like the idea of having the kitchen and the living room kind of tied together in one space, because if you are entertaining and you have people over or something, it would be kind of nice to have that connection. I'm kind of looking at this now and I'm kind of like, you know, this might be more nice to design in Revit when I can actually like bump the walls around. So for the thickness of the walls and stuff, what I'm seeing in my head, I think that we want to make sure that the envelope is airtight and that's why I'm really beefing it up and doing probably a little bit thicker than what you'd see on some other tiny homes. I think people, other people would opt for having the 2x4 instead of the 2x6, but because we're going to be in Canada and it gets very cold, I want to make sure that we have a very well insulated tiny house. So I'm going to keep this envelope beefed up. We can get a little bit smaller in our interior partitions. Okay, I'll admit though, at this point, by the end of the stream on this day, I was starting to get a little bit impatient. Uh, I, I explained it in the VOD, but it, basically I kind of jumped the gun and I started going straight from bubble sketching into 3D modeling and I backpedal. That's kind of why the timing of this is a little bit weird. And I will confess that I, I knew that I was mentally tapped out, but because we were so close to actually starting to sketch floor plans, I was like, I need to keep going. I, I've been reflecting on it and thinking about it since then and I'm like, there's so many other things I want to actually just weigh and take into account before we throw it into 3D and start modeling it. And so the reason why I backpedaled, this was a really, honestly, this was super helpful. Reflecting on how it was going, I realized that a really helpful step for programming, at least for a tiny house, given how it is the way that it is, it was really helpful to review all of the elements that we wanted in our tiny house and decide which floor level they could be on. And this is just because in a tiny house, your full height head height is only the main level. And then the second story is usually a loft or has a lowered ceiling height. What I'm realizing is you're kind of confined laterally. Like you can kind of like everything's kind of just like in a row where we have a little bit of variation, I guess, if we're looking at the tiny house, you can kind of play around with like how things are stacked. Looking at this list, for example, like the living room. I think we could do a living room in a tiny house, either either on the main or the second floor. Generally, you're just like hanging out on the sofa, watching a movie, reading a book. It's more of like a decompression space, I would say. So I wanted to take a second before we get back into our bubble plans to just really talk about where in the house each of these spaces or rooms would be best suited. It was really helpful in determining, like the kitchen absolutely needs to be on the main floor. There's no way you're putting a kitchen in a loft. Same with probably the bathroom. So uh, by listing which things in our tiny house could go in, either in the loft or on the main level, that was really helpful with space planning and trying to decide what goes where in our bubble diagrams. Once that was figured out, uh, I wanted to explain the mandatory design strategy that I'm using in this tiny house. And you may have seen this design strategy before. It is utilized by Shay's Tiny Homes and you can view my reaction to that tour on this channel or I encourage you to watch the original video yourself because the design is genius and I explain it more here. There's a strategy in tiny house design that allows you to stand up in the loft and get full height headroom. And it entails basically putting the standing height or like the floor where on the main level you don't need. How do I explain this? If, if we have cabinets along this wall on the main floor, then on the second story above here, this can be recessed a little bit lower and then you can get full height standing room. So we have our bubbles, we have our standing loft strategy. We can finally start to sketch the actual walls and the casework and all the doors and the elements in a floor plan. Let's send it. One thing that I'm seeing about this design that I don't know if I like, there's an imbalance from 
where the staircase goes, where there is more, I guess, rooms that you exist in on this side. And that would make our living room up here really large. Let's try something instead. I'm not gonna scratch this. Let's try something different. This is probably a good candidate for option one. I don't necessarily know upon first glance if it's my favorite favorite, but we'll see how it translates in 3D and elaborate on another one of these floors. Would an island work? I'm pretty sure you need a three foot clearance around an island, but in a tiny space, could you get away with two and a half? Maybe instead of having it in an island, it just goes right up to the bathroom wall. We can design this one for a longer trailer if we decide that we want to try and make it work. This is the second floor plan we've tried to make work with a design like this with the bathroom, and I just don't think it works. We're not getting any laundry in this design though. This kind of sucks. That's that one. This is the last one. Okay, it's, it's generally not good practice from a bathroom design to put the toilet in a position that if somebody accidentally walks in on you, they'll see you right away. But because of how this door swing is opening, I think the door swing will kind of conceal anyone in there. <laughs> The one thing I'm realizing between all of these three options is that they all have similar upstairs configurations. So I don't necessarily think it's worth it to look at the upstairs of all of these designs too meticulously. So when all's said and done, at this point from sketching, we have four floor plan sketches that we really like that we're ready to put into the 3D space. This is something that you can do in 2D on paper. You can draft it yourself and just get a little bit more detailed, like take the bubble diagram and then go and get a fresh piece of grid paper and then start it all over again from scratch, clean slate. This is at this point where we'll start accounting for wall thicknesses and actual door thicknesses and casework sizing. We want to get a little bit more to scale. So I prefer at this point to throw it into 3D just because I find it a little bit easier to manipulate and kind of push and pull the geometry. It's just much quicker to do it that way. So that takes us to step three, my favorite part, 3D modeling. So before we dive in, I have a disclaimer. The software that I'm using is called Autodesk Revit. It is a software that was developed for architectural 3D modeling, and it is what I use in my line of work. I think it's really quick once you know what you're doing. It's kind of like building in Sims 4 to me once you get there. That being said, it's not cheap. <laughs> so I don't think it's the most accessible software. However, everything that I do in this 3D model can be accomplished in SketchUp. Uh, SketchUp is a free software. It does have a bit of a learning curve, but if you are a DIY person, if you are interested in your own projects at home, I highly recommend learning because I use 3D modeling for so many of my personal projects, like all of them. However, if you're a little impatient, you don't want to do the learning curve, you just want to jump right in, there is a lot of free floor pla floor planning softwares on the internet. A couple examples are like homesuite 3D and floorplanner.com. They all have default information embedded in them like wall thicknesses or door sizes that you can kind of just like start throwing it down and then configuring it yourself. I've personally never tried any of them myself so I can't speak to which one is the best but if you are curious about me taking a gander, doing a couple reviews. That could be kind of fun. That could be kind of fun. Another thing. You can try to use Sims 4 to design. It is something that I've seen talked about in the casual hobby design community a lot. Uh, that being said, Sims 4 is not to scale and the geom like the scaling of components in Sims 4 is kind of weird, so you're probably gonna have some struggles. Anyways, let's 3D model these babies and we'll get this show on the road. We did set up three design options. We have option one, option two, option three, 
And we can keep adding more options if we want to like test variations of things. We can duplicate things. It's pretty easy. We did preemptively last stream kind of start setting some stuff up because I, I got really excited and I was like, I want to know. And then I realized that it's not, it's not going to work very well. <laughs> I'm just going to, let's just delete everything. Um, I don't even know how they make loft framing. We could, actually this might even be the safest, we could talk about doing metal framing. It's way lighter. We're doing this for sure. Tiny houses are so squish. I honestly, I just kind of think the work from home station that we're trying to make work here on this main floor is just kind of ruining it. Like it does just make sense to get rid of this entirely and then make it a living space. But then we are literally, this is the exact same layout as the tiny house tour that we watched last time. I guess let's just move over to option two. <laughs> Okay, wait, I need to share this with all of you just because I haven't really like gotten to tell anyone and nobody's seen my stuff anymore, but I need to share this. Hey, hands down, this is probably the most embarrassing thing that has ever happened to me while live on stream. As I was setting up my next stream to model option two, this happened. Oh no! So I spilled my coffee and I thought it was fine. I tried to keep 3D modeling. I did some of option two, and then it just kept going wrong. Holy. <gasps> oh no. I think I lost my keyboard. On the bright side, I did get a shiny new keyboard out of it. So on June 2nd was when the real 3D modeling starts. So let's go back into plan. Let's see if we can make this work. Hmm, this is just weird. I don't think the kitchen works here. What if we swapped the kitchen and the living space? I'm kind of sad. I was really curious just about how this like living room kitchen dynamic would feel. Let's duplicate this option and let's just say we disregard the work from home situation and we just try and do what is on the right side of this. All right, well, so we kind of got like two options out of this sketch, I guess, and we lost our work from home. We did kind of say we have our work from home station in our tier two element list rather than tier one. Like tier one is like, we must have it. We can't live without it. Tier two is like, we're gonna try really hard to incorporate it, but if it has to go, it has to go. Cause there's so many options that are available that I've seen where you like have like an external, like another tiny house trailer that you put your work from home stuff in. And like when we're talking about having a separation between our day-to-day -day life and our working environment, having a f like two physical separate spaces is the ultimate way to be separated from it. I'm not opposed to just axing it entirely. So what's our next option here? Let's go to our last sketch. This is a nice option, I think. My technical issues as a baby streamer did not stop here. And June 6th was the day that we finished modeling 
all of the floor plans that we wanted to put in 3D before we reviewed them. I blue screened when live and I lost half of the VOD. So it's a little bit weird in the time jump, but my apologies. With all said and done, we did end up with six tiny house floor plan options. This was due to duplicating options or combining elements from the options that we had into 3D and kind of playing around and seeing what worked. This is what I love about 3D. It's so much easier to just copy and paste and then kind of adjust and then you have a new option and it's so fast and so easy. My best designs honestly are usually after I put it into 3D and I see how everything interrelates and then I see that something might be better and then I duplicate it and then I adjust it. And it's usually like more often than not, it's the designs that I have tailored in 3D that I end up keeping rather than the ones that I thought I liked on paper. Paper is just a nice springboard. And when you're at the point that you think you are happy with all of your floor plan candidates, you've brainstormed everything, you think you've got it. This is my favorite part. Let's review them and rip them apart. Okay, friends, let's have a talk. If this is your first time watching me, welcome, we're happy to have you. If not, you may know me from my house tour reaction videos. Before we dig into this, I want to preface my approach to design reviews. Design aesthetics are subjective, but practical design, to a large degree, is not. There's a reason why we have building codes and design guidelines, and my job in my industry is to know what those are and to make sure that they are implemented. When I review a floor plan, or a house tour, or any design review that I do on this channel. I want to be realistic with you about the practical implications of a design decision that you may make and how it will affect you when you flow around and dwell and live or exist within your space. That being said, a lot of the time, this is based off of your needs and values, and that is what varies from person to person. A family of four who likes to game, for example, altogether will have different needs or wants from a house than a outdoorsy couple that loves to cook together and don't have kids. A person who is visually impaired will have different needs from a space than someone who is mobility challenged. And so what's practical for different demographics will be different. I'm reviewing these tiny house floor plans from a specific lens. This lens is very likely, if not guaranteed, to be different from a tiny house plan that you would envision for yourself. But hopefully, the logic that we discuss while reviewing these tiny house plans or any design review that I do on my channel, hopefully that's helpful to you in how to think about these practical design reviews. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, let's take a minute and let's review these from the beginning. And this was the first one that we started with. The two things that I like about this are the size of the kitchen and I do like the size of the bathroom, but what I don't love about this bathroom design specifically is I don't really like having the vanity under the bulkhead very much. Actually, in this design, we did not bump this down. We kept this full height, so maybe this isn't too bad. It's this work from home station that I'm not really a huge fan of. Did we do a different option with it? Yeah, we did. So this is, okay, so option five and option one are essentially the same option, but the only difference is that instead of having a work from home station here, we just use this whole central area as the living room. I actually love this design a lot. However, it's the exact same as one of the tours that we watched. So these ones, option five, like we'll keep it, but again, I just, I don't wanna flesh out a design of something that's already designed. This option two here, if we get rid of even like the front door entirely and we can talk about what this looks like in design development, I don't hate this. The only hesitancy I have about this is I'm not quite sure if it's worth compromising the full-size bathroom to have a work from home station like this. Um, the, this relationship here though makes me a little bit nervous. I just worry about this clearance and how like that would feel. Weird pinch point. But this kitchen is sick, very full size. We didn't place a sink though either actually. And in hindsight, just with having this cap counter a little bit shorter, like this is better. But again, it's such a small little prep space here. And because you need to bring this back so that we don't have this pinch point at the stairs. Okay, we'll go to option three. I I actually really like this one a lot. I like the C-shaped kitchen a lot. We get like a 
workstation here on the end. Then we talked about having some kind of way to almost like wall this off or like seal it maybe so that you're not just like looking at your workstation but i really like the size of this kitchen too the only option with the bathroom beside and i know it's a tiny house so it's relative as the space is so small but that's kind of it too in this option that we just did where we have this kind of enclosed toilet shower room at the end then there's like some separation between the shower and the toilet space from the actual like kitchen down here. We did try to strategically place the toilet kind of on the farthest side so that it's like not very close to here. I think it might have like the coziest shower design. It doesn't really have a good spot, I don't think, for a washer dryer though unless you put it beside the vanity again. Like you could maybe do it here. Uh, I, I'd be nervous, I guess, about like where this bulkhead bumps down above the kitchen. You're also very limited if you want to be able to use this countertop. You can't really use this back wall for any kind of storage or anything. I don't think I like this C-shaped kitchen. We don't have any like actual prep space. Even like taking into consideration just like how this bulkhead impacts everything. I wouldn't have, like if I was designing this in AutoCAD in 2D, I would not have realized how much it influenced the feel of everything. I don't think that the kitchen in this option has a lot of prep space though. And then this corner is really like weird, separated off almost. Like even if you look at it from this angle, what would you do with that then? Because it's so deep, it would be really awkward to have shelving. But I do like this living room on the end. I don't know. Moving on. Option four. This one is almost a better version of the option that we just looked at. So if you look, it's still like bathroom on the end, kitchen in the middle, living room opposite side. This is kind of the same. It's, it just doesn't have, I guess, that like linear work from home space that we were trying to see if we could fit in. But I think it's a lot better without it. This rectangle is the footprint of a whole sectional. It is kind of strange to have the door from the kitchen open right into the bathroom across from the toilet. What in a tiny house is that? Is that like a sacrifice you make? Because space is such a hot commodity. I really like this full wall of storage here though. Stuff can shift around in here too. It's not married to where it is. The only thing that we might like kind of be lacking that I don't know if we can get into this design is uh, like maybe a place to sit down and eat your dinner that is not at this sectional sofa. But that might be a sacrifice you make in a tiny house. I think we can fuss with this a little bit more if we pick this as a floor plan and make this better. Okay, option five we did look at and it was the exact same as the hazel design. Option six. This one is my favorite bathroom configuration down here. I just think it'd be so nice and practical to have your washer and dryer right here, all of your clothing storage here, you're getting ready for bed. Oh look, your PJs are in here. The other thing that we talked about having, which we have not been able to fit yet in any of our designs, is like outdoor storage. If this is a future tiny house for Krish and I to build, uh, we're from Canada and our tiny house will be parked in Canada and we got boots, we got coats. I've seen under the stairs be used as like a closet. Say like you could have the shoe storage under the step in the front. Yeah, I don't know if you had like just like a little, wouldn't be like a full height one, it would probably be like a little short, um, a short closet. You could have like a coat rack here for any of your like immediate jackets and then you could have more just like larger storage in here too. I think this is my favorite. Yeah, no, like the only thing that you could do different, I guess, to switch it up with this is to literally just mirror the living room and the kitchen. But let's just duplicate it and try and swap the living room and the kitchen and then just... Okay, okay, I think I've decided. I changed my mind, this is the best option. Hopefully you would spend most of your time on the sofa looking out the double doors rather than the kitchen taking the priority space. Yeah, I, I'm leaning towards that too. I think that we should plan to do these two floor plans, option six and option seven. Like you can only get so much out of doing design in a bird's eye view. Once we take this into elevation and start like really designing what this stuff actually looks like, that will probably be the tell for which of these two options is the best. So that means that we are done design, schematic design. We're done schematic design. We have our floor plans that we're gonna work with. 
And that is my tiny house floor plan design process. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it helpful. I hope there was some insightful takeaways for you if you are looking to design your own tiny house, whether that is to actually live in or just for fun. There's a lot of us that like to design for fun, I'm learning. As of filming this video in January 2024, we are still working on the tiny house kitchen, which is the first room that we are starting to flesh out. And this is largely because I have a bunch of personal home renovation projects that keep taking precedent uh, on my stream, which I do design live if you're interested in coming to hang out and watch. If live design is something that is of interest to you, uh, I stream on Twitch two or three times a week and I do things from media reviews, uh, live design, house tour reactions, and DIY discussions of all sorts. It's really fun. We'd be happy to have you. It would be a great time. So hit the subscribe button if you would like to see more home design discussions. Uh, design review content or any DIY related activities and thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye!